Masters. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, this is my favorite crowd. It really is. I love speaking here. But before I get started, being a lawyer, I've got a couple of disclaimers that I've got to make. <laughs> First of all, a lawyer giving a presentation about chess. Doesn't sound very compelling. I understand that. If you haven't filled up your coffee, fill it up. If you fall asleep in the middle, I will not be offended. But if you're a snorer, please think about your neighbor before you fall asleep. You might want to leave the room if you're getting that, that place. So. Another disclaimer is I did not pay attention to the slide guidelines. Um, I was reading them after I produced my slides. I broke every rule. So I apologize. I should have hired a professional. I didn't. My slides really, they're not compliant. So sorry about that. And for the organizers, next time I will review the, uh, the guidelines first. So, so here we are, chess and law. So it was a morning. Saturday morning, it was an October Saturday morning, about a year and a half ago, and I was sitting on the couch in my living room, and for some reason, out of the blue, I decided I want to play a game of chess. Now, before that, I, you know, I learned how to play chess as a kid, but I just never really played, but I knew that there were websites where you could go online and play chess with strangers, um, and so I found chess.com, I signed up, and I started playing. And um, let's see if I can, oh, there we go. Got my buttons backwards. So this is a self-portrait. <laughs> Me playing my uh, first game of chess. Unfortunately, I'm not a great artist. I couldn't draw a couch. So you'll have to visualize I'm not in a kitchen chair, but I'm actually on the couch playing my first game of chess. So from that day forward, though, chess has been an important part of my life. And uh, it's brought me a lot of entertainment. It's brought me education. I have met a ton of interesting people. And it's really enhanced my life. And so this morning, I'd like to share that experience with you, along with a few lessons that I have learned. Fortunately, I have five lessons, which is an odd number, which I just learned is a very good thing to do. Like my humor, it's not planned. Anything is incidental, any success in marketing for me. So chess is a, an ancient game, but it's also very popular, which I learned uh, this morning just talking to people. I now have several challenges to play people, and I am a beginner, not very good, um, but I do take all challenges. I'm 314 Brian on chess.com. If you want to send me a challenge, I'd be happy to play. So, but even though it's an uh, it's ancient game, it's popular, 75% of US adults have played chess at some point. Can I see, is there anybody? Who, who's played chess at some point in their life? So we're pretty close. We're probably pushing the average up a little bit. I'd say 80, 85%. But the, so the stat that's surprising to me is 15% of adults play regularly. And I thought that I'd let my you know, inner geek come out in my late 40s by embracing chess. But apparently, 15% of America is as geeky as I am, which is awesome. <laughs> so, but it's an ancient game. It's a game of strategy, it's also a game of tactics, it's a game of deep thinking, and also intuition. So uh, this is the, the beginning uh, of a chessboard. You can see that each side has uh, 16 pieces, they're a lion ready to do battle. So there's six different pieces, and the, the different pieces have different values. Now, you don't, there's no scorekeeping, you don't gain points in chess, but it's important to know the relative value of the pieces while you're playing. And so the pawn is worth one point. Um, the knights and bishops are worth three. Rooks are worth five. The queen is worth nine. And the king has infinite value, because if you lose the king, you lost your game. So the value of the chess pieces is basically a function of the, pe the piece's mobility. So each piece has its own rules on how it can move. The pawn is only worth one point, because it really has the least mobility of any piece. So it can only move forward, it can't move backward, and it can only move vertically in the file that it starts in. Um, it can move two spaces on the first turn, uh, but uh, one space any other turn, so not very mobile. The knight is a lot more mobile, so it's worth three points, and it moves kind of in L shapes. So it goes over two, up one, up one, over two. So this knight can move to any of these eight squares from where it starts. Bishops are very mobile, worth three points. They can move diagonally in any direction. 
so this uh, bishop can move to any of these squares. You'll notice that it's on a white square and it can only stay on white squares, that's why it's not more valuable. There's also a dark squared uh, bishop that can move to all the dark squares. The rook, move as many squares as it wants, up and down, side to side. Since it can move anywhere on the board, it's worth five points. The queen is the most valuable piece because it can move anywhere. So the queen can move any of these spaces. And then the king can also move in any direction, but just one point, or excuse me, one, one space. So here's the, the basic rules for moving and capturing. So you can't move through another point, but for, you know, like every rule, there's an exception. If you're a knight, you can move through another piece. I think I said point, I meant piece. Um, you capture a piece by occupying the square that it's on, and once a piece gets captured, it's out of the game. So you start with 16 pieces. Once they get captured, your army kind of dwindles down. So here's some, some quick scenarios. Uh, this white rook, if it's white's turn, can capture the black rook by going to its piece. The bishop can move diagonally and capture it. The queen the king can move over one square and capture it. Now the pawns, uh, again, there's exceptions to every rule. The pawns are the one piece that don't move and capture in the, in the same way. So as I mentioned, pawns can move forward one square. So the pawn on the left or the right of the black rook can move one square. The pawn in the middle, though, is stuck. It can't move because it can't capture forward. Pawns capture diagonally. So the pawn on the left can capture the rook diagonally to the right, the pawn on the right. So in this example, the left one takes it. So, so here's a, I'm going to show a quick maneuver called an exchange. And uh, an exchange is basically where one, uh, one side uh, gives up a piece, it captures a piece, but in, in doing that, it's going to give one up. And it's important to know the relative value of the pieces to know whether the exchange is, is worthwhile. So here, the white uh, bishop captures the black rook, but then the pawn is going to take it after that. So is it worth it? Should white do that? Um, probably so, because it gives up a bishop worth three, um, but black gives up a, uh, a rook worth five. So that brings us to lesson number one, which is your greatest strength can be your biggest weakness. So you can see um, in, this, in this position, um, the uh, black pawn is protecting the black bishop. bishop. Um, and uh, so if the white rook captures the black bishop, the rook's going to be given up too. So it's not going to be worth it because in order to capture the bishop, uh, white's going to lose a piece that's worth more. So the pawn is very effective in protecting other pieces. So what about a situation like this one where in protecting a piece, the pawn is going to be sacrificed also? And that's where the value of the pawn really comes in. And so, so here we've got the same situation, but at the end of the, the series of moves, uh, the white rook is going to capture the uh, black pawn. So will the pawn be effective in protecting the bishop? Yes, because in order to take the bishop, white will give up a rook worth five, and it'll only capture pieces worth four. And so the pawn is going to be effective um, in, in protecting that, that piece. So you would think the queen, because it's the most mobile piece, would be the best one to uh, protect other pieces. And you know the queen is most valuable because she can move anywhere. Um, but that's also her biggest weakness. So if you put her in the same situation, protecting this bishop, at the end, the queen's going to get captured. And so what's the math here? White will gladly uh, collect a, a, a bishop and a queen in exchange for a, a rook. So the queen's greatest strength in chess can be its, its greatest weakness. And that's also true in life and in business. Um, a lot of us have read the book by uh, Richard Gerber, uh, The E-Myth, or The E-Myth Revisited. And he talks about three different personality types of, of people who start businesses. So you might, um, you know, you might be a, a great pie baker, so you decide, I'm going to open a bakery. <clears throat> well, being a good pie baker, a good pie baker uh, you're a good technician. You can actually do the work well. Um, but there's two other types of uh, personalities, and that's manager and entrepreneur. If you don't have a manager personality where you can run an operation, not just bake pies, or if you don't have the, the vision and the risk-taking uh, spirit of an entrepreneur, 
your business is never gonna work. You'll be stuck working in your business, not on your business. You'll make great pies, but you'll never be a successful business person. And a lot of us are great technicians in our business, but we're not good managers or we're not good entrepreneurs. Some of us are good entrepreneurs, but we're not good managers or technicians. So whatever personality type you are, don't let that strength be your biggest weakness. Don't let it derail your journey of building your business, but find other people that, that can complement your weaknesses and don't let your, your, your biggest uh, strength be your greatest weakness. So lesson number two is that solid strategies lead to tactical opportunities. And so one of the uh, biggest challenges as a beginning chess player is you know how the pieces move, but then you don't know what to do. Is this a good move, a bad move? If you follow these three basic opening principles, then you're, uh, and you're a beginner, uh, your game will improve immensely. So control the center, develop your pieces, and protect your king. So here's a starting position. So one of the things you want to do is control the spaces in the center. The other is to develop your pieces. You can see uh, that black, the back line of pieces, they're all stuck behind pawns, so they're kind of useless. They can't do anything. So you want to get those, uh, those pieces out into the action. And then the third is to uh, protect your king, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. So this is uh, the most popular move in chess, is to move the pawn in front of the king two moves forward. And you can see that in doing that, uh, the uh, pawn exerts some control over some of the center pieces. And then a good uh, second move is to move out your, your, one of your knights. And you can see now we've got eight, eight squares that are under uh, the influence of these two pieces. And one of the advantages of moving that pawn out is it opens up an alley for your bishop to come out and come into the game. And then once that bishop's out there, look at all these, these squares that, that you have uh, control over. And then the last one, there's a special move called castling where you can move your, if, if there's no pieces between your king and your rook, you can move the king over two squares and move the rook on the other side of it. And you can see it tucks him away nicely. He's very protected by his rook and his pawns. So that's a good, solid opening strategy. This is one of my games. Um, four moves in. I'm white. You can see I tried to use the good, uh, the good opening principles. I've got uh, one of my pawns out there. I've got three pieces developed already. But my opponent, has only moved pawns. So even though he's got some good control over the center, he hasn't developed any pieces, and his king is a long way from being castled. And, uh, and he gets punished for it later. So this is several moves later. And uh, if, if you look at this, this position, on the, the next best move is to move the bishop over here, which will attack the queen, which is a very valuable piece, and the rook, which is more valuable than, than the uh, than the bishop, and so the queen's gonna have to move out of the way, and the bishop's gonna take the rook. And this, there's still a lot of work to be done. Certainly the game wouldn't have been won here, um, but um, white's in a really good spot here. Unfortunately, I didn't see that move, and so that's not the actual move that I made in the game. So. <laughs> One of my other disclaimers that I wanted to tell you is I'm, I'm a bad chess play player, so. Lesson number three, deep thinking and intuition complement each other, and they're very important. One of the real lessons I learned from chess is just the power of focused thought. So this is a, an example of a tactics puzzle, and uh, one of the, um, one of the you know, ways to train and, and learn chess is to look at these uh, positions and try to find the best move. There's one really good move that will basically win the game for black. And you can look at these things and mentally move all these pieces in your mind for several minutes and then suddenly the answer will, will come to you. And so you don't see it at first. It's not intuitive at all. And so here, if the black king, queen moves over, <coughs> and the, the board's actually upside down because it's black that's moving, but it's from white's point of view, but it forces the king uh, to run away. And that's gonna give the black rook an opportunity to move down. And now the king has nowhere to go, so the queen is forced to take the rook. And there's black's queen ready to take uh, white's, white's queen. So, so deep thinking is a real part of chess. I mean, sometimes you just have to really, uh, really look at it and study it. But intuition is also very important, because sometimes you can just feel you're in trouble. And you don't see it yet. Something looks off, and then you look at it more closely, and you realize that, that you're in real danger. Um, 
And so one of, one of the interesting examples of that uh, is uh, Magnus Carlsen, who's been the world uh, chess champion for five years, or ex excuse me, longer than that, since 2013. Um, he faced off against uh, Fab Fabiano Caruana last November. Um, they played 12 games, they tied every game. And Magnus uh, is you know, not just a, you know, an, one of the best players ever, but he's also known for just having good, great tuition, intuition. And Fabiano is known for being able to calculate so many moves in advance. He can just really figure out what the best move is. But that takes time. Um, and so they played 12 games, they tied, and uh, you know, the kind of the intuition versus the deep thinking. And then um, Fabiano, unfortunately, uh, got beat in the tiebreaker games, which were, were quicker. And he didn't have time for, for the calculations, and so the intuition kind of won out. But uh, I, um, you know, just that, uh, to me, you know, one of the most important lessons in, in this is just that deep thinking is very powerful. Um, I often try to solve problems by mulling it over for a long time, and, and often, you know, a solution might come to me, but just deep focused thinking can be uh, very powerful, but intuition is also very important. And uh, I should say on that too, before, before I leave, I know I don't have a ton of time, but I think I have time to finish up and still say this. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote The Tipping Point, also wrote a book called Blink. And the subtitle is The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. And it's really about um, how powerful uh, intuition is, particularly in fields that you have a lot of expertise at. And sometimes that split decision, you know immediately what the right answer is uh, just because of your intuition. That's really powerful uh, in life and business and also sometimes in chess. So lesson number four, old dogs need new tricks. I was 48 years old when I discovered chess. It's really, um, it's really enhanced my life. It's been a lot of fun um, and uh, made my life better. Um, a lot of times we kind of get in a rut. I don't know what I was gonna do that Saturday morning, um, but it really kind of changed you know, the next year and a half of my life, hopefully longer, um, and really influenced where I was going because I you know, was interested in something um, I decided to, uh, to pursue that a little bit, and uh, now my life has greatly been enhanced by that. Um, the daily grind, and especially in business, can really be a grind. Um, but we should try to look for new horizons and try new things. It might really enhance our lives, and, and who knows where that'll lead. Um, I was just sitting on the couch on a Saturday morning. Um, now I'm saying weird things about chess in front of an audience of business friends. So <laughs> you never know what's gonna happen. So. And then my last lesson, the magic number five, don't be afraid to get a little mud on your face. Um, I started playing in October. I just played online. I really got pulled into the website and playing people online. And then after a while I thought, chess is geeky enough, but I'm doing it on a computer in the privacy of my own home. I should get out there and share it with other people and meet people. So I went to the St. Louis Chess Club and joined it and started playing chess uh, there. And St. Louis, by the way, is one of the most amazing places to play chess. Um, if you go to the Central West End, you're gonna run into Grandmasters because that's where the chess club is. There are some of the best chess players in the world come through here. The uh, St. Louis, or excuse me, the US uh, Chess Championships has been played in the uh, St. Louis Chess Club for the last 11 years. And I've seen, uh, I mean, you can go watch them uh, uh, in, in person play and I mean, I admit watching people play chess isn't necessarily exciting, but seeing people that are the best at the world at what they do, and you're standing five feet from them and watching them do their thing is, is pretty magical no matter, uh, no matter how interesting or how little you understand about what they're actually doing. So, um, but, so I, I decided to, to go play in person, and I knew when I went there, you know, I'm not a good chess player, I was a beginner, I'd been playing for maybe six months, I knew I was gonna get beat bad. Um, but I didn't expect this. <laughs> so, again, this is a self-portrait. Um, I'm, I'm the loser. I don't know if you can... So this guy, and I'm think, I have a literal game in my mind. Um, and uh, it, it was a long game, a uh, long time control, so we had plenty of time to think. The poor guy was eight years old. He was bored to death watching me try to struggle and find good moves. He was walking all over the, the tournament hall. And then he'd sit down and make a quick move and then walk around again. <laughs> and after he defeated me soundly, um, I asked him 
so, you know, how old are you? He told me he was eight. I said, how long have you been playing chess? Which is kind of a funny question, because <laughs> it couldn't have been that long. So he's been playing two years. Um, and he's probably better than I will ever be if I continue on this journey with chess. But, but you know, the lesson for me is, even though it's humbling, I mean, I'm, I'm a business lawyer. I'm used to, you know, having some uh, say that's somewhat authoritative in a lot of situations. Um, but in this, uh, you know, the kid can move a piece as well as I can, and he certainly knew where to move them and when a whole lot better than I did. But I wasn't afraid to, to get mud on my face. I still go, I'm still getting beat by the eight-year-olds. Um, <laughs> although there's a couple there that I can actually beat, so. <laughs> and every now and then there's an old man like me uh, who's also there to play, so. But what is, what's your chess? I mean, for me, um, you know, I, I got up one day, I discovered something new that enhanced my life, and it was there to be had. Um, all of us also um, have those things, those opportunities. If you're willing to broaden your horizons and take, um, you know, take a chance, and don't be afraid to, be, to have mud on your face, but ask yourself, what is your chance? What is your chess? And, uh, well, just go do it. So I think we have time for questions. Two questions. I thought when she said I was out of time, that included, did not include questions, but. Questions for Brian? Perfect then, thank you. This isn't a question, oh. I just wanna tell you that something really hit me, which is when you're under pressure and there's not much time, follow your gut. It's a really big message. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question over here. Okay. What's the, what's the biggest lesson you've learned from playing chess that you've been able to transfer over to your business? I, I think it's the deep thinking. I really, that was the one true eye, eye opener is just, I never understood the power of just focused thought. Um, like really, really focused thought. You're doing everything, putting all your mental powers on concentrating on one thing without doing anything else for a few minutes. That's, that's pretty amazing, so. And I know we're out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs>